This is Phil Barassa, and you're listening to Whelm, The Young Justice Files. Hello, team. Welcome back to Whelmed Reprints. It's the holiday season here in the States, so we'll be taking some time to spend with our families and to get ready for Season 3, premiering on January 4th, 2019. With Whelmed Reprints, our team will be picking a few of our favorite episodes to bring to new listeners. And our second reprint is another two-part discussion that I revisit over and over again. Morgan Jenkins, Dungeon Master and creator of the Going In Blind Actual Play podcast, came on to discuss the critical skill of engaging your watchers, readers, and players by getting them to ask the right questions. At least, that was her original idea. (laughs) Morgan's insights into how to incorporate all of your senses into your prose, scripts, and games is inspired. As you'll hear, Morgan is charming, insightful, imaginative, analytical, empathic, (laughs) and hilarious. Every time I hear her on a podcast, I feel like I'm being snuggled in a warm, geeky blanket. (laughs) Astute listeners will also notice that there has been a change in pronouns between our original recording and this intro. It's not a typo. Morgan, thank you for honoring who you really are and for living your best life. We love you. By the time this episode airs, DC Universe subscribers will also have access to the first enhanced episodes. If you haven't heard... A selection of episodes from Seasons 1 and 2 are being released with additional digital content, including commentary from DC Comics and Young Justice creators, as well as us, the team from Whelmed. We don't know in what order they'll be released, so if one or more of our episodes are available, we hope you enjoy them. We were honored to be invited and had a blast helping out. We hope you enjoy today's double-length collection and your upcoming holiday season. Stay Whelmed, everyone. Recognized. Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, going in blind, D-1-8. Today in the cave, we have an example of the wonder of living in the future. The brilliant and charismatic Morgan Jenkins is coming to us from Australia, host of the Going in Blind podcast. Going in Blind is a Dungeons & Dragons actual play podcast whose players are visually impaired. Morgan has guested on such industry podcasts as the Dungeon Master's Block and DMnastics, discussing the art of storytelling using rich, detailed, and emotionally poignant description. Morgan also happens to be a new fan to Young Justice. Morgan, honored to welcome you to the cave, man. Honored to be here, um, and completely terrified and excited and ecstatic. I would say very much, having once been whelmed, I can say I am overwhelmed. All right. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series so far, the comics and the video game. If you have not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, please consider this your warning. And with all that, let's dive in. So I touched on a few things in the intro, uh, Morgan, but tell us a little bit more about who you are and what you do in the world. Who I am is of no importance. What I do is slightly more interesting, I think. I've worked with Vision Australia Radio for a number of years, just doing odd projects for them. And because I love Dungeons and Dragons and I love combining things that I love in strange ways no one else would, I thought, wouldn't it be great to take Dungeons and Dragons and make it accessible to people who are vision impaired? Because that requires very little work. And I love doing very little work. Unfortunately, I then thought, wouldn't it be great to record those and edit them and turn them into an interesting story-driven podcast? That requires a lot of editing. A lot of work. Which is a lot of work. (laughs) Um, But it's a lot of fun, and we've had a bunch of players now come in and play, some recorded, some not, and some people can hear on Going In Blind, some you won't yet, but when I get around to editing them, you will. We've got more episodes coming out this year, which is exciting. Because we've had a bit of a break, unfortunately, just due to illnesses within families and people having commitments elsewhere. It kind of pulled us all apart, but we're back together and we're back to it. And it's basically just a group storytelling adventure. It's a D&D Let's Play, and it's been a lot of fun and has really changed how I DM as well. 
Yeah, I'm going to get into that a little bit later too about how the environmental pressures, so to speak, have you focus on different kinds of skills of storytelling and writing, both really. But I hinted at it in the intro. When did you first see Young Justice? And what inspired you to watch the show? So I first saw Young Justice, I want to say a, a few weeks back now. Uh -huh. And so I'm quite new to the series. And what inspired me, well, I mean, the way I saw it was very, I think, emblematic of a, of a deeper problem with Young Justice in that it is a good show. How dare they? So I sat down to watch one episode. I swear, just one. And then I'm going to bed because I have a work at six in the morning. 16 episodes later, <laughs> uh, I was in a bit of trouble. And then I came back the next day and went through the, I'll just finish season one. That's all I'll do. Oh, maybe I'll watch the first episode of season two. Oh, no, half of season two is gone. So in the course of about three days, I'd gone through the entire series, then discovered from Neil from DMnastics and, and now Dungeon Master's Block that there was the video game. And so I found that and went through that as well. And I'm hoping to get my hands on some of the comics soon. But what inspired me to actually get into it, I am pleased to say it was you. And it was you before you did Whelmed. It was, it was actually, I can't remember where the conversation happened, whether it was in a podcast I was listening to or in one of the Facebook groups we're attached to. Mm. But somewhere you were trying really hard not to be a super fan of Young Justice and failing. <laughs> and... <laughs> So I, I that is that doesn't sound like me at all. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you're like I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be brief. I'm gonna mention it maybe twenty times. It's fine. Shush. It's all good. <laughs> and so I ended up going. Well, this is something I have to put on my list. And then more and more people that I trust when they talk about shows that are good or bad or why, just it kept coming up and kept coming up. And I thought, all right, well, no, I'll. It was on my to watch list, but I'll actually I'll shift it up and put it right up the top there. And I'm very glad that I did, and also very sad because it's one of about four things that have been able to make me cry while watching them. So, yeah, um, yeah it's, yeah. Which is always a, a good test of a TV show, if it can make you feel feelings. How dare they? Yeah, exactly. I think that was the original title of this episode was How to Get Morgan to Feel Things and Then Destroy Him. <laughs> I think something like that. Is that what we were brainstorming? Something along those lines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what was your experience with DC, like DC and comics in general, before you started watching the show? Like, do, do you have a comics background or were these characters all new to you? Oh, no, the, not all of these characters were new to me. Certainly some of them were. But I, my very first going far, far, far back into the distant past of the 90s. Ugh, that, that hurts. <laughs> There's a time travel show on at the moment and they keep going back into the past to the 90s. And it makes me sad inside because I get all of the cultural references. <laughs> but I grew up watching Lois and Clark. Oh, right. Yeah, of course. And that was my introduction before even watching the, the Superman films. That was my introduction to what Superman is and what this world is. And then... Of course, Batman, the animated series, though the airing time in Australia for that was weird and they did it out of order. So okay. it's it's also on my list of things to go back and rewatch to actually get it as a whole story, as it were. And other than that, the TV shows now, unfortunately, getting into comics is incredibly difficult to know where those jumping off points can be. And... To that end, I've listened to a number of podcasts about comics and about the creators of comics, hoping that someone somewhere will say, here's a great way to get into this series that you might be interested in. And yeah. torturing all my friends to try and find those jumping in points. And of course, trying to have money for comics because they cost money. Yeah, I hear you. And, and as, as difficult as that is, at the end of the day, it's a medium that I think great stories are being told in at the moment and we need to support it and... So really trying to support it. But mostly at the moment, yeah, it's the TV shows, Arrow and Flash and all sort of the rest of the Belantiverse. Right. And that's kind of where I'm getting a lot of my stuff from comic wise at the moment. Well, that was one thing a few people have told us is that Young Justice became a kind of an on ramp for some of these myths you know, these stories and ideas, which is fantastic because there's a lot going on. I mean, we've got a whole podcast. <laughs> so I, I first heard you talking about storytelling techniques in the going in detailed episode of the Dungeon Masters block. Ah. And it blew my mind, man. It was absolutely fascinating because as a gamer and a comic fan, for that matter, I love bringing detailed visuals to my table. 
I, maps, pictures of my supporting cast characters, miniatures, crazy looking dice, just whatever, right? To keep my players engaged, basically to cheat and hopefully have them think I know what I'm doing. Yet, as an author, I don't have those tools, so I'm focused on finding ways to both invoke images and or evoke emotional reactions out of my readers without using any of that. And so it's interesting to me when I was listening to you, because it's like when you're running a game for visually impaired individuals, you, you have to merge both this love of your gaming with the improv, with improv skills and those improv skills with the descriptive verbal writing skills in a way that I've never really used. So can you tell us a little bit more about going in blind, like how that started a little bit and kind of that aspect of the skills you have to use? Okay, yeah. Well, I, I found my DM style was not that going into the game. And certainly going back and listening to some of those earlier episodes and listening to how much editing had to be done to make it <laughs> a, a functional story, I, I'm not ashamed to yeah. say there was a moment when I lifted up a book and said, the town looks like this, and Kat just sat there for a moment waiting for me <laughs> to realize what I'd done. And uh, and she's, she's sort of gone. That is just a blob across the table. What are you doing? Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, no, I'm so sorry. I'm a monster. I'm terrible. What have I done? <laughs> and she just laughed and threw something. Um, I think one of the the big sort of foam die we have. And 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 so it became this way of choosing moments that were important and finding things that were thematically important and important to me and important to the story that we were telling and just finding different ways of showing that so if you were to have a major plot point whether it be a villain or whether it be the big bad's room or what have you you're going to have a representation of that now for a lot of tables that is bringing out Tiamat and putting it on the table for other games it's like you say bringing out those bits of paper and saying hey here's what they look like for me I didn't have that and so it became about using other ways to draw those connections and then learning that I could extrapolate that out into other aspects of writing. So it became about finding those points of connection to the places that I thought were emotionally relevant. And so it would be, you've walked into this big cave and it's meant to be scary. How do I make it scary? What sounds, what smells, you know, what kind of touch yes. under your feet yes. of the rocks around you? And just using all these other senses, it, but also using sort of descriptions of, of what they're, they're seeing as well, but finding what the important things are. And, and it really honed my ability to look at what the emotional impact of an individual scene should be. And then what the players do within that scene, that's entirely up to them. But it's just, what is that initial emotional impact I want them to have when they walk into a scene? Yeah. What is the emotional impact I would like them to have coming out of that scene based on yes. whatever direction yes. they go in? and finding descriptions and ways to get them from point A to points B, C, or D, whichever one they choose, yeah. in a way that flows and in a way that the details are enhancing, not detracting from. Right. Does it affect how you, either how you write now or, or how you even read or consume media? It, it has, in the, th that combined with just working in, in sort of radio editing, I'm a lot more interested in the soundscapes that people put behind and through shows, TV shows, radio shows, whatever it is I happen to be interacting with. And yeah. when reading books, looking at the way things are staged in a book, because when you place characters down on a map, you are telling a very specific story and you're unfolding it in a very specific way. You are putting people in positions of power of, uh, if you want to draw the horrible Star Wars third episode thing, you're putting them in the place of higher ground and therefore they have the advantage. <laughs> but, Thank you, Ben Kenobi. <laughs> I love that the Mythbusters then went along uh, and said, nope, that's rubbish. Don't, that doesn't mean anything. He's just saying words. But <laughs> That's rubbish is the best thing I've heard. That. Oh, sorry, derailing. No, my train has never been on the tracks. But it's, it's that kind of thing where I look at the placement of characters when people walk into a room or when people are, are interacting with each other in a space, in a story. I'm a lot more aware of that. In the past, it would be two people are talking and whatever other fluff around it is not important. I'm just paying attention to the conversation. It's irrelevant. And yeah, yeah. that was the case in TV. That was the case in movies. That was the case in books. Now, 
if the writer has gone to the trouble of giving me that context of where this conversation is taking place, if someone's moving around in the space or if they're standing very still, what they're picking up, what they're fiddling with, what they're doing, and using that to then feed back into how that character is feeling. Because a lot of characters in good shows will say one thing and weirdly be feeling a whole collection of other things that they're not voicing. Right, right. And so using these cues to pick up on that. And one thing that I love about Young Justice is that it's not actor choice per se, it is show choice and animator choice that they do these kind of things. Yeah, we've talked about that a ton on the show, and it's one of the reasons, one of a few reasons I wanted to have you on the show, was because of that filter that you work with through storytelling, this unique filter and presentation, both with radio presentation and with a game at the table, even when people are present with you. And those choices that I know that I was sure you were noticing, right? The visual looks on characters' faces in the background or the sound, the audio in the background, where the choices are made, right? But like we started talking about having you on the show because you were live tweeting about watching Young Justice I'm not sure if I can call it live tweeting because basically you had blown through 16 episodes so quickly you couldn't actually tweet about them, I think. But you had said, I think you may have cursed my name and then something about 16 episodes. And then, uh, yeah, and then you moved on. So when I asked you, I was like, hey, you're presenting some really interesting points of view on Twitter. Do you want to come on the show? One of the things that you said that you really wanted to talk about was kind of this idea about where we're talking earlier about asking the right questions, getting your players and or readers and or watchers involved in the story by planting these things that aren't just exposition, you know, telling us a story. You were feeling this story. You were taking that emotional ride. But how do you do that? And as we were talking about it, it became this focus of we all wanted to know the answers to the questions that they were making us ask. And the question wasn't, why am I watching this garbage? (laughs) It was, you know, uh, we'll talk about a few examples from the show, but like getting your readers pulled into your story by asking the right questions. So I wanted to start off by talking about what we mean by that, about getting your readers or players or watchers to ask the right questions. What's your view on that? My view on that is complex because... Asking the right questions to me is only half of the trouble. I mean, the the main questions that I had going into season two, and I will delve down into that very soon, but my big questions were, who is Beast Boy? (laughs) Why bad guy? What? Where has he gone? What? Why? Where? Huh? And (laughs) why did Megona or Conshin or Super Martian break up? Why is he being a petulant crybaby and make it stop? And (laughs) because for me, you have these larger emotional and the way that emotion is drawn out in Young Justice is fascinating and intriguing. Uh, But you have these larger sort of set pieces that they bring in, like the death of Artemis and the lead up to that, where they punch you in the gut with it early in an episode, then go back and pull you through the entire episode until you get to that point. And then the revelations that come after that point. Right. But... One thing that I like, and these are sort of, these are moments that are, they they hang on them a lot. You get a lot of flashbacks to them. You get a lot of time for the characters to be on screen absorbing these moments and discussing these moments. And I thought, what about these sort of the subtler, smaller, emotional gut punches that you get that don't hang around, that they don't hold on to? And they they don't stick around with. So these tiny, tiny moments of realization that we then very quickly move on to other larger questions that are still just as big and just as important, but aren't given that screen time per se, except you get to see the ripples and ramifications of them. And they're arguably some of the more important questions. And the fact that the show is smart enough and the show has enough faith in us as viewers that they're willing to give us the answers through subtlety and context, and they're not going to just spoon feed the answers to us uh, it, just because we want to know. And so I'm going to do something that I don't think anyone should ever do, and I apologize for doing it, but I'm going to compare this series, specifically the jump between season one and season two, to another show called Glee. 
Okay. <laughs> Which has never been done and should never be done again. Okay. Because jumping... Ju- I'm fascinated. <laughs> because jumping into season two, we start in media res, something we know they do well. There's sort of a new Robin, then a Beast Boy, and then other people turn up, but the other people aren't given as much time as this new Robin and this new Beast Boy. Then we see the haircut, which is given more time than those people, and she cut her hair. What? Then five years later, and we hear Nightwing. And if this were any other show, I would be worried. Now, I was confused, but not worried, because they built that story trust through season one. Right, right, right. And because... I was listening to you and checking in to see if season two was still good. And you're like, it's different, but good. I'm like, okay, that's, I'm fine. There we go. Um, yeah. And so with that time jump, all of a sudden this happy relationship we got at the end of, of season one no longer exists. Three minutes in, we've got Lagoon Boy and his angel fish. And <laughs> so <laughs> between season one and season two, at the end of season one, everyone's in a relationship. Everyone's happy. Everything's great. Yay. Hugs. Go home. It's great. Start of season two, they've broken up. And very quickly in that episode, in fact, it, like in Glee, the same thing happened. At the start of season, end of season one, everyone's happy. At the start of season two, one of the main and sweetest relationships in that season, kind of the flagship relationship for the nerdy and the outcast like myself, had broken up. And they'd broken up for the dumbest reason... And it was explained in the worst possible way, in the, hey, here's some exposition rubbish way. And if anyone here has watched Glee, it was, I can't remember their names, so I'm going to use the stereotypes. And for that, I apologize because they use the stereotypes because they're monsters and terrible writers. But (laughs) it was the young Asian woman and who who felt like an outcast and had dyed her hair because that's how you know she's an outcast, apparently. (laughs) And the young man who is sad because he can't dance because he's in a wheelchair. Aww. So he has dreams about dancing in episodes directed by Joss Whedon. And, oh, sorry, I have to stop you right there. That episode where he sings safety dance and dances around in the mall, that was a Joss Whedon episode? Yes, that is the episode. Is that why that's the only episode that replays automatically in my head periodically? That episode is amazing. It was a fantastic episode. It's what actually made me sit down and watch Glee, was it was directed by Joss Whedon, it had Neil Patrick Harris in it, and it had a really fantastic story done in a really interesting way, and really sweet, and really uh, bittersweet. And I then went into the rest of the series being like, maybe the rest of it will be this good! Not quite. Yeah, you were mistaken. Oh, and and certainly when, when they jumped to season two, and all of a sudden you have, oh, she's broken up with him because he's not Asian enough for her parents and she wouldn't understand his Asianness, so she's now going out with the Asian it was so beyond problematic that it hurt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't watch enough of I liked the first season fine in this I think we stopped watching in the second season for unrelated reasons, so no, I didn't realize that it happened. And it was explained in such a terrible mm. We try and stay positive on this show. But, uh, I'm just letting you know. <laughs> but it was it was so it was it was so painful simply in the way that and again I'm there are ways that you can deliver that information that isn't terrible. <laughs> and the question of why they broke up was resolved in such an awful way and the answer itself was awful, but it was resolved in such an awful way that it just created a disconnect with the show and I had to step away from the entire show. And so coming into season two here in a lovely show that's friendly and would never hurt us, sarcasm, show, are you listening? We get a very clear, they are broken up. We see that Wolf isn't happy about it. Very quickly we get some subtle FaceTime with baby soups and we know that he's not cool with it. And that makes his later chat in episode two with Alana interesting when he's saying, I dumped her and she left me no choice. Yeah. But he thinks the new Atlantean is good to her and a bit of a jerk. And all of this is happening. And the only thing going through my head, the very first big question, this this question, uh, if we're talking about the right question and and how to answer it, is where is this old Atlantean and why? Because we've got this new guy and he's not the old guy. And where's the old guy? And that brings me to a really interesting one, which is Tula and the revelations and realizations about her, which are so subtle that they're almost entirely played as background. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So, like, in season two, episode three, Alienated, about, oh, I want to say ten minutes in, we see, we get that realisation that the son of Manta that we've been seeing is Calderam, and that he's gone to the bad side and we don't know why. But the fact that they posit that question in episode one of where has he gone, who is, what, why, why has he been replaced, and they wait until the third episode, which in real world... That's weeks of waiting. For me, it was about 10 minutes, but it, for everyone else, it was oh, yeah. weeks of waiting to find out. So at this point... Don't tell me about this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. This is, this is why I'm, I'm always sad about people who binge things. Yeah, my wife, who got... She loves, loves Calder. And we got into the first, like, handful of these episodes, and she's like, I can't watch this. What is happening right now? I can't. I can't. I'm like, just, just keep watching. He's not a traitor. Oh my gosh, he blew up that island. Yeah. And like all these people were on it. I can't. We had to literally like, because we were binging it because she binges things and she we just had to stop. She's like, I can't. I got to take a break. And she just had to stop because she couldn't handle it. Right. Not necessarily in a bad way. She needed to know why this character who she had grown to trust and love in the first season had done these things. Right. And then when he reveals even when he reveals, like, to Aquaman and the rest of us, like, you let Tula die. We're like, wait, the what the what? Yeah. Like, okay, and then why didn't you tell me? And this was my mistake, Cal. And, like, you're like, oh, my gosh, I want to see this conversation that had happened. And, we, of course, we get to see it. Um, Neil was on, our, on the show telling us about the video game Legacy, where we get to see that scene. But again, these are you, you make a perfect point that I was going to bring up maybe a little bit later, but we can nod to now, which is this idea of knowing how to reveal things organically within the story, right? We didn't need to know all the background, and indeed it was better to not know the background of what is happening right now. Now, I will say that there are definitely plenty of watchers of Young Justice who did not care for the time jump because it made them uncomfortable, like they were so like confused by what was happening. And I'm making a speculation here, but I think those of us who understood or knew these characters understood pretty quickly what they were doing, which is, oh, Robin is now Nightwing. Oh my gosh, they've jumped five years in the future. The storyline potential for this is enormous. We can immediately introduce characters like Tim without going through an entire season, right? It has us ask that question, who is this Robin in the grotto who's apparently dead? They never, ever mention Jason's name through the entire season. So you just know there's a dead Robin and that's it. And the, the grotto is an interesting one as well. Although, sorry, just very quickly with that, we were talking about that reveal of Calderon being evil per se. And we then find out in a later reveal he's not. But when he does that first reveal and someone says there's a bomb and we've got it covered, he gives the first perfect where he says perfect in a way that suggests at the time to us, oh, he's happy and this is all grand and part of his plan. But later, when he's undercover and we know he's a goodie pretending to be a baddie, and when Artemis is undercover and we know she's a goodie pretending to be a baddie, every time some baddie makes their life more difficult, they always say perfect. Yep. They always say it without sarcasm, and they're always totally sarcastic and have to change their plan to accommodate it. Yep. And I thought going back and re-watching this episode and seeing that reaction... And then that they sort of call back to that reaction later on. Really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. When he finds out that there's that bomb and goes, perfect. Of course, the, the magical moment, which I get Carrie Payton on the show to talk about Aqualad. Um, I want to know, like, did he know the entire season? Because, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they read the whole season. Because if you when you rewatch that scene and he says, perfect, you can almost, I don't know if I'm doing it myself, but you can almost read his, like, subtle pause. And it, it re like you hear it differently mm. when you go back and listen again, right? It's not perfect as in, yes, it's perfect. Oh my God. <laughs> right? N yeah. N now I have to try and save all my friends from this bomb. And then the way he does that is fantastic and, and different and interesting. And, and the moment where like Nightwing and, and Aqualad are in the bottom of that cave where the bomb is and Aqualad says, is it just you and me, old friend, or something like that? Like he's finding out if he can talk, right? Yeah. And then Superboy comes down and it's not. And then the way he's like, now I'm going to have to pretend to grandstand while warning you about this bomb. Right. Time to monologue. 
<laughs> yeah. Time to become a supervillain in monologue. In rewatching it, it gives it answers so many other questions as well. Sorry, I think I may have derailed you though. So <laughs> not a problem. Yeah. So you were talking about like the question of who's Beast Boy. So did you? Oh well, j- just before Beast Boy, we were about to talk about the Grotto. Oh, which yeah, yeah. is an interesting one to me. Oh, because uh, we were talking about the, this death of this middle Robin that we don't know about, and certainly I knew that there were a number of Robins because and, and that one of them becomes Nightwing because I have tangential understanding of this sort of thing. There was a fan TV series made about Nightwing years ago on Kickstarter, and I might have backed it. Uh, <laughs> but it was a lot of campy fun. But in the grotto, we've discovered, oh, you dare question me, uh, you let Tula die. And now we then see not just that Tula died, because you're like, well, okay, how did Tula die then? This is more questions. Why did they let Tula die? Was that does that mean she was part of the team? And we discover in the grotto, she was part of the team. She was Aqua Girl. She was part of the team. She was she was at some point leaving Atlantis to join the group. And this is an interesting one because again, like Beast Boy, and like uh, you get these smaller, big to the character emotional pain that is just left in smaller moments in the background, kind of puts it in our psyche without beating us over the head. Yes. And I think that's fantastic. The fact that when they're in the grotto in episode eight and they're in the cave with the holograms and they're standing in front of Artemis and they're talking about her being dead and they're all in mourning and there's a blue guy that no one recognizes off to the right that we get a bit more context on a few moments later. But in the background of almost every shot, like when people move, the camera moves with them in such a way that Tula is in the background. Like, they'll push each other and they'll step off to the side and the camera will move so she stays in the background, right there, in the centre of the frame almost. Right, right. Always just there. Interesting. And so while she's she's not a main part of the story, they keep reminding you this has happened. This character that you met and you know is important. We saw how important she was in season one to a, a number of our main characters, but especially to Cal. And, you know, in, is a further reminder of his pain and Garth's pain and Aquaman's pain. And because they're reacting to Cal's actions in that scene, they're seeing Artemis and they're talking about how could he have done this to Artemis. And we are getting this reminder that right there in the background is how he could have done this to Artemis just ever-present, hanging over everything, and not referenced. Absolutely. And she was definitely part of why he agreed to be so reckless and go deep undercover. Yeah, absolutely. And we haven't gotten into reviewing any of Season 2 yet, but these are the same kinds of things that we talk about, the things that get dropped in the background. So these are visual cues, but a lot of the examples I put in here were things that people had said, like for Artemis in Bereft, where they all lost six months of their memory, and... Kid Flash is like, do you got a green arrow thing? Or like, what's going on with this costume? She's like, oh, dad probably put me up to it. And he's like, well, why is that? He's like, oh, he probably wanted me to kill you. And then then like a bomb goes off or like the, the tank blows up the building they're in. And you're like, what did she just say? And the way she said it as well, so matter of fact, like, well, I, I guess I'm supposed to kill you or something. Yeah, she's like, oh, he probably wanted me to kill you. <laughs> he wanted me, probably wanted me to kill you, the jerk. You know, it... And it, it makes you, again, ask that qu- those questions of who they are. But it gets even subtler than that, the idea that Superboy in that very first episode saying, Superman can fly. Why can't I fly? And then it doesn't come up. The general idea that he's less powerful than Superman comes up as a general plot point or general motivation, but not specific. Like, we specifically get an answer to why he can't do this, as opposed to just hand-waving it. Oh, clones are less powerful. But also, we get it episodes and episodes down the road. Exactly. So it's it's a throwaway. It's not a throwaway line, but it's, it's a line that tells us something about his character that we as the audience and he as a character don't get a resolution for, for literal months, it's, it feels like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this idea that with an ensemble cast in particular, the idea that they can literally like shuffle these little character development points and little handholds for us throughout a bunch of episodes. It's important because with an ensemble cast, you have so many characters. You, you, it's nice to spend, you know, an episode focusing on a character, you know, uh, cold hearted 
for Kid Flash or whatever performance, really kind of focusing on a lot of Robin, even though other characters are in it. Like you get these character focused episodes, but really every episode has little bits and pieces, but you have to understand every character that's in a scene and make choices as to who's going to be in a scene in which to reveal these pieces of information as it goes along. And, and that takes so much planning, yeah. right? And I also find it's interesting that you get these ideas of the things they reveal and when they reveal them, sometimes it's an emotional impact for the characters, but not for us. And I, I've, or at least muted for us. And I don't know that I've come across a TV show that does that, that allows the characters to have a moment that you're maybe privy to, but isn't played for you. Interesting. So for instance, the death of Artemis was played for us. The characters, a lot of them had, you know, were in on the secret. A number of them weren't. So when they're in mourning, we're in mourning, then we get the reveal. But it was emotionally played for us, the viewers. We were there with them feeling what they were feeling. Yeah. The next big question that I had at the start of season two after this time jump, which is who is Beast Boy? What's going on there? When that gets played out, the emotional journey that they're going on is one that A, they've had before. B, we're not really privy to. It takes about a minute for them to get through it. And then you have to unpack it yourself. But the TV show has moved on. Yeah. So it's a moment for the characters, not for you. And you then have to almost make a not conscious effort, but you then extrapolate out from that the emotions. Like the scene you're talking about is the scene on Ran yeah. when Beast Boy sees a lake yes. in a waterfall that looks exactly like the one in which his mother died. It's in. yeah, in uh, Earthlings near the end. That was brutal. So throughout that whole episode, you're getting and and again, you're wondering who Beast Boy is, and you're getting you, you know, oh, hello sister, hello brother. Uh, here I am in Camp Granada, and then. <laughs> Just before the the revelation, sorry, just before the revelation, she hugs him and we get a quick reference to blood transfusion, which I missed because I was overthinking the whole sister brother thing and going, oh, is he another Martian that's come down and now he's doing this other thing? What's going on there? Um, And I missed the obvious. But you then go, wait, oh, when she says you get, you'll get, you know, he says, what, what power will I get? And she says, you'll get the power to listen to your adoptive sister. You're like, okay, adoptive. So why did she adopt him? Because I'm so slow on the uptake. <laughs> and if you're paying attention in the episode in season one image, and I wasn't, again, she's talking about being a part of the family. Like Marie tells her she's part of the family. Yep. Garfield himself calls himself her blood brother. And so these one-off lines in image about family, to me, at the time, meant, oh, she just she wants acceptance, she wants a family, she's scared of losing all these people uh, and losing all that because of her white Martianess. And she even says, and you played me an AMV this morning as I was trying to make coffee, where they take that line of, of her saying, you are my family to the group. And certainly in image, that's what I took from it, of you are my family, this group is my family. Not even thinking, uh, of course, of course she's going to accept that throwaway line from Marie about your part of the family now. And of course it's going to mean so much more to her than they would ever know. And, and you're just, all of this is after the, like realization after the fact is I got none of it until beast boys face changed. Yeah. And that's when it clicked into place. That's so interesting for me to hear from somebody who maybe didn't have a history with these characters before, because as soon as in, of course, image, like we're watching it, I was like, Garfield Logan, <laughs> oh, it's Beast Boy, right? They're, they got Changeling in this. That's interesting. He's really young. And as they went through it, and then, you know, of course, they completely changed his origin for Young Justice in getting this blood, because Miss Martian's not as old as him as a character, mm. they did this blood transfusion, and I'm like, oh my god, he is literally a green, shape-changing superhero. <laughs> Whoa. Like, ha- like, they did this brilliant way of folding his origin into what makes sense for the story uh, in here, and then carried it through into the next season. And they, they do it in, it in such a fantastic way. Talking about subtle things, that's a setup and a payoff that I never would have realized that you're there with it all the way back from image. Whereas I had no knowledge of this now until we get to the waterfall and the image of the car. And that's all they give you. And yet, you know, you know what happened to his mother, you know, straight away before she even mentions queen B why he's now with Megan. And you see 
uh, interestingly, it then puts into context everything I saw in the previous episode and in that episode, where in the face of all this insanity and danger, he's just this bubbly, uh, effervescent thing. And it's like a parallel with Robin from season one, like in Homefront, yeah. where he's being chipper and he gets called on it by Artemis. Because it's just, it's that right. coping mechanism to what is basically PTSD almost, or certainly post traumatic stress. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so you've got Miss Martian, you know, having caused these mutations, feeling guilt over not being able to save his mother and feeling like his family for so many reasons. And here he's got those same coping mechanisms and it's functioning. You see it functioning. You see him functioning right up until this waterfall. And the fact that it's a waterfall on an alien planet is irrelevant because the second he gets to that waterfall, all of this carefully crafted bubbly lightness fades away. And his mask that he wears, the fact that his face is literally completely different from that of the face he used to have, that he's hiding his face, he's hiding his real self from the world and protecting himself and building up these layers of armour of fakeness uh, with the sideburns and all the rest of it, and that whole thing is just stripped away by a waterfall. And it all unfolds in a minute. And that's it. Yeah. From the 15-minute mark to the 16-minute mark, you get all of this just exploding in this giant unpacking box in your head. I had to pause Netflix and go for a walk. <laughs> because it, yeah. you, you get the answer and you didn't realise you didn't really want the answer to who Beast Boy was. And to see it told in this way where he... He does. He freezes, and it is post-traumatic stress. Whether it, it's full-on disorder or not, it, it is post-traumatic stress. And the complete shutting down, and you extrapolate from that the idea of these are young people in a war zone, or, or, or not necessarily in war zones, but in war-torn countries and, and in fights and battles, being affected, and how crippling that can be. And the fact that it's not only soldiers that have to deal with this yeah. kind of thing, but it's it's kids, whether they're in the fight or not. Yeah. And the fact that his post-traumatic stress comes from before he joined the fight and was the cause for him to join the fight, yeah. but it wasn't during fighting, as we so often see with all oh, soldiers as a fighting causes. No, it's just being in these situations. And yeah. that McGann then has to go into his mind to get him back which is really crazy because then when she see her she we see her do the same thing to an alien's mind later in that episode and in episode 3 and who sees it and how they react and the implications that that has yeah. um yeah it's just again it's that more subtle pipe laying for later revelations and, and and I say subtle because in this episode like going back and rewatching it you get it's three words and a look from Connor and in episode three, it's a look of open mouth horror and then anger. And you're not even focused on it because she's bringing out these revelations about, oh, I know what the their plan is. And they bury it behind very quickly. She says, I know what happened in the missing 16 hours. Yeah. And at the time you don't realize it, but it's all laying pipework for, for me, what was the biggest question because I am a shipper at heart. And that is the super Martian breakup reason. Why? Yeah. Why they do this? Yeah. And again, we get that it could have been an episode all to itself, but instead they choose to have the episode be about Artemis and her death because it's, it's episode seven, which was depths. Right. And the fact that they place, again, they couch these moments in much bigger moments. So for those of you who have the questions, you get the answer and then we, the show moves on to other things, but you necessarily you don't. Yeah, like seven minutes into the episode with Artemis and her dying, we get an answer to that question, and the fact that it's taken them seven episodes to get to that answer with a couple of sort of oh he's not happy he's not happy you can see that he doesn't like the way she's using her powers, but up to that point I'm still thinking oh he's He's just whining. Yeah. The breakup was his idea. We find out and he disapproves. And they finally, finally have that conversation when they're alone in her ship. And that's at the seven minute mark. And so that's all fine. That's great. I'm on board with that until we get to the eight minute mark. 
where everything goes horrible and scary and I feel sad. Yeah. Because we find out she tampered with his mind. Yeah. And the way he says, how could you think I wouldn't recognize your touch inside my mind? <laughs> right. And the way he says it and the fact that we're close up on him and far on her and then we get her reaction and, and I, I had to pause again. And in two minutes we go from – thinking this is an argument about how to deal with enemy combatants and the different moralities about what is and isn't acceptable in war to the revelation, ultimately, that Baby Soups ended what was becoming an abusive relationship, basically. Yeah. Because she... She was taking gaslighting to an entirely different level. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, lit I wrote that down. She's using her, her psychic powers to literally gaslight him. Like, she makes him doubt her memory. It makes him doubt his memories, sorry. And that invasion, we know from back in season one what that kind of invasion means to him and reducing him to a means to her ends. And so all of a sudden yeah. we go from six episodes of he's petulant and whiny and she's a bit too killing for his liking. Why can't they just kiss and make up? I want them to love each other. They still clearly care for each other. Hugs and kisses and hugs and kisses. To, at this point... She's an abuser. Whether she means to or not, that's what she's become. And at that point, I honestly don't know that I can forgive her, never mind him forgiving her. Yeah. And the way that it's handled, the hurt he's still feeling, because of course he is. And one thing I noticed on rewatching it for this discussion, they have this hum of the engine in the background. And then throughout the conversation, as the realization and revelations come out, the engine sound, that hum, starts blending with this super subtle music and takes on a really sorrowful tone. Oh, interesting. Which just drives through this pain that he's feeling and the imagery of her steering the ship from this position of strength, sitting there, two hands on the, on the balls, <laughs> from basically a throne of righteousness. And he's sitting in front of her, down, lower than her, saddened and dejected in this moment, accepting that he wasn't enough to stop her, to save her from herself, to fix her, and that she, he couldn't stop that. And those kind of thoughts and the way he expresses them of, I can't fix her, I tried, I did everything I could to make her better, yeah, and it didn't work. They're the kind of thoughts that you hear a number of abuse victims uh, who have who've then gotten out of it um, sort of talking about and saying and, and discussing. And so I thought it was a really... A really interesting way of dealing with emotional trauma inside relationships and the fact that he was then able to get out of that and doesn't go back to her for ages until she has her own realization of, oh, yes, no, I have been abusing my powers. I am an abuser. It takes her a while to get to that point, and then yeah. she actively goes down this path of redemption, at which point he can come back to her. Right. Now, whether that's a genuine path of redemption or not, we don't know. I really hope it is, because I love them both. But yeah. the fact that all of this is unpacked in about a minute or two minutes, and it's all unpacked as an answer to a question that was honestly a superficial question, but important to me, of, why have they broken up? I love them. And the answer to be this complex... And this much of a gut punch and to take this long to get to. Yeah. And to have ramifications that fly all the way back through the series and all the way forward through the series through to the way that she then destroys Cal's mind. And again, that's that kind of thing we saw coming. You can see the pipework they're laying and you can understand, oh, she's going to do this now. She's done it. But this, this punch in the gut, this answer to this question, the way they did it still amazes me that it would like you don't get adult shows that go into this kind of depth with this sort of thing yeah exactly exactly and the ability to be able to drop these questions does a number of different things one of them like you're talking about it has us compelled to watch because we want to see the answer to the question but it's not just a single answer to a single question it's not a yes no answer to a question. It also makes us speculate on how the puzzle pieces go together. So talking about the moment in which Beast Boy and Miss Martian run into Aqualad on the, I can't remember if they were on a base or if they were on the Manta sub, but when he comes around the corner and you see her and you see the look on her face and her eyes start to glow and 
before it even happens, you are horrified because you can see it coming, even though it's only a split second between we see her come around the corner or see him come around the corner and her frying his brain. You feel that you can see it coming seconds before she does because we have we it's something completely unrelated right the, the things that led up to us being horrified by this dynamic between miss martian and calder has nothing to do with miss martian and calder right the things that led up to that moment were other things there were clues and pipes, as you say, laid in relationships between her and other villains and between her and Superboy and between, you know, her and previous seasons of things that she was doing and couldn't manage and fail safe, the episode fail safe. And like all of these things are all laid so that we get to put those pieces together ourselves. They are not telling us a story. We are getting to experience the story and take that emotional roller coaster because they have compelled us to ask the questions right and try to put those pieces together it's this show continues to be mind-blowing and as you as you keep re-watching it as you specifically keep re-watching it and or continue listening to our show hopefully you'll see the more and more and more and more and more layers of ridiculousness that has gone into the thought process behind these as you say even single hero stories like arrow don't put this much time, effort, and depth in the world in which the story is being told. And the fact that because it's animated, every single frame and reaction has that thought behind it. It has to have it. It's, these can't be spontaneous actor visualizations that they're doing in a moment. They could be the voice actors maybe putting a tone on something that the animators, you know, now interpret in a particular way. Uh, in um, what we watch, uh, War, that AMV that you were watching this morning, mm. um, War, they do some great cuts of the relationship between Roy and Oliver. And the scene where you hear Crispin Freeman's voice change from that angry Roy we're used to, where he says, where he, there's like a pause, and then Roy says, it may not have been clear, but I'm not, I don't feel that way. I don't feel that you're a failure. You're a good man, Ollie. And you hear that tone and that change in Crispin Freeman's skills as a voice actor to be able to deliver those lines appropriately, likely fed into how they changed, like relaxed his face in the animation and scrunched his eyebrows and those kinds of things. But all of the things that are happening in the background, particularly things like you're talking about the music and the sound blending with the hum of the bioship, I'm going to have to rewatch that scene just to... Hmm. to see that to experience that and affecting us in ways that we, we don't realize until we go back and analyze or start a podcast and start talking about it yes or focus your your life on vision impairment and realize that there's a whole world of things out there that you hadn't even considered and yeah <laughs> if it's doing its job sound isn't being paid attention to if yeah. it's working you don't notice it's there yeah and one thing I've noticed in Young Justice is you don't notice it's there, but it's there. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. I have heard cinematographers in movies say, if you notice my work, I am not doing my job appropriately. And I know writers have also said similar things. Like, if it looks easy, if I've made you reading the story look like it was easy to write, then I've done my job. Because it wasn't. It was nightmarish. <laughs> But if everything looks like they make sense and one step obviously leads to the next step, obviously needs to the next step, obviously leads to the conclusion, then I've worked my butt off to make it look that way. And we see aspects of that not working in other shows, but the fact that in Young Justice, you get that. You get these big questions thrown up at the beginning of, of season two or wherever else you personally may find them. Certainly a lot of mine came at the beginning of season two. And going from that to giving us these answers and bringing them out in places that make sense right. and in ways that we wouldn't necessarily have realized that they were there. And like I said, a lot of these ones that we've been talking about today, the answer, the answer turns up in about a minute of TV show. And then the ramifications of it are felt back and forward from that point. Right. So unlike some of those bigger ones, like the death of Artemis, 
where you're only really dealing with it with the, in that one episode of, oh, wait, she died, and then we flash back and we go through it. These are, are smaller, subtler answers to questions that we had that really, while their on-screen time is very short, yeah, the reaction they instill in us and what we then take going forward into the rest of the series has enormous impact. It's as if, I was thinking earlier while you were talking, it's as if almost every scene in Young Justice or so many of their scenes are all in media res. Yeah. So everything starts. So like the original Star Wars, A New Hope, where you're dropped into this crazy star battle nuts stuff, and that gets you asking questions. What's happening? Who are these people? Why are they upset? Who's this princess they're talking about? You know, blah, 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 blah. You're asking questions. But it doesn't have to be that blatant. Mm. It can also be... You're now in media res with the five-year jump, but there are times when I feel in media res in an emotional moment. Something is happening to characters that I care about, or something is happening to characters I've never met. Like, there's something happening. What is happening? That's the first question. There's a pretty common thing that happens as feedback for new writers. A new writer who's writing a novel, it's pretty common for an editor or someone giving feedback saying, get rid of the first four chapters. Your story starts in chapter five. Oh, especially if it's a fantasy story, oh. because inevitably the first two chapters are the world of Doobledo is a giant world and has seven cities and 47 continents and right. three children. And right. You've built this world yep. and you're really excited about sharing the world. Right. So what do you do? You just share the world. Right. But a lot of... When they say you start in chapter five, the story starts in chapter five, it's because we don't need that world building at the start. We need you to give us good, interesting, impactful storytelling and then build the world around that. Right. And that's something they do not just with world building, but across the board with story building, with character building. They always make you feel like you've just walked into a room and things are happening. Yeah. And you'll get that context when it's important to get that context. Yes. But for now, you're just engrossed in the story. Absolutely. And that's what I think is one of the foundations for understanding how to use it for your own writing of getting your readers to ask the right questions, right? And there's simple things too, if we can shift gears into that a little bit, because I want to talk about the practicalities of this a bit, if you don't mind. Of course. So starting with like little things, like not having characters say things that are weird, that would be strange in a normal conversation. Like you and I are having a conversation. I'm not going to say, well, Morgan... What I mean to say is, because that's not the conversation we're having, right? The, the Morgan would be there to inform a reader that Rich is speaking to Morgan because clearly somebody hasn't made my dialogue unique enough for someone to be able to tell who I am, right? Or not starting a bit of dialogue with, well, as you know... Then why are you telling me? Well, th then why are you telling me again, right? Like, well, Morgan, as you know, I'm the host of Whelmed. There's a cheaty, cheaty version of that that has started turning up in places where people have discovered the term lampshading and they think, oh, well, if we lampshade, we'll be fine. And lampshading is a term where you do something silly or a writery gimmick, but then you point out that you've just done it. Yeah. And somehow that makes it OK. And so we're getting a lot of in TV shows, people will do the they won't say, as you know, but they'll say, well, this and this and those three people are actually the bad guys. And the other person, there'll be a beat and the other person will go, yes, I know that. Yeah. I was there. And they'll go, oh, yes, of course you were. Right. I wasn't explaining this for a third party that's watching. <laughs> right. And yeah, to me, that's almost just as bad because you're trying to be sneaky about it. I call it painting it red in the show, which mm. is a term, like a writing term I think I picked up a while ago. Like, I don't mind painting it red, but the painting it red needs to be done with a purpose and not as a crutch, right? Joss Whedon did crazy stuff on, say, Buffy. That One of the things that cracks me up that I think is a perfect example of the things that he did is he would take those TV tropes that you didn't even realize you were allowing for in your own mind and then flipping them on your head. There's a scene where they're all standing around in a, in a mausoleum and they're waiting for a bad guy or some terrible thing to happen. It doesn't happen and they all leave. You're laughing. Do you know what scene I'm talking about? I Maybe. don't, but it sounds so familiar. Okay, so they all leave, and Giles is by himself in this mausoleum, and he's like, yeah, I guess they're all right. I should leave. So he walks out the door. Then the bad guy immediately like walks in stage right and starts monologuing. Little do you know, I don't know what he said, but he's like, little do you know, Giles, that I am 
setting up this great thing. And then Giles walks back in and he's like, is there somebody in here like talking? (laughs) Because and in your head, you're like, oh, my God, that's hilarious. Because in your head, you don't it's TV. You expect someone to walk in off scene and start monologuing. (laughs) But he takes that trope and puts it and turns it on its head. He's like, yes, I know I'm monologuing. And I'm not only going to point out that I'm monologuing, I am going to pull the whole thing and then giles like runs in and immediately like punches the guy in the face like it just he folds it into that story it can be okay but mm. it's not an excuse it can't be used as an excuse to say well i can't think of anything better to do i'm gonna just do this and it certainly shouldn't be used for exposition for information if you're using it for comedic effect like that yeah that's fantastic or for sure. for continuing story forward but when it goes bad for me is when you're using it to move the story back and fill us in on stuff the characters already know. Absolutely. And if you're going to be doing that, put another character in there that is the cipher for the audience so that characters have to explain what went on for that third wheel. Yeah. It's still just as gimmicky, but it makes more sense for the structure of your story. If you can, don't do exposition, basically. Yeah. But if you have to go the exposition route, at least give us this... a character that is the cipher for the audience. Otherwise, you are just painting it red or lampshading. In a negative way, you're doing it for not the right reasons. You're not doing it for moving the story forward or for comic effect. You're doing it to tell us stuff people already know that we're not privy to. And right. and it'd be interesting to go and see how often Young Justice does that because I bet money on the fact that they do it for story, for character, and not for going back and filling us in on those sorts of details. Right. Because they use heartfelt conversations between two characters or interesting uh, discussions between characters to fill in those blanks. Yes. For instance, like in episode two, we get a lot of why Connor broke up with Megan and it comes from him having a discussion with an alien on an alien planet. It doesn't come from him talking to one of the team about this thing yeah, or bringing it up with her. It's no, he's explaining it to someone who is different, who has noticed these subtle cues that both characters are throwing out and is calling into question on it. Yeah, absolutely. You can take so many of these scenes and break them down. Superboy is not going to want to talk to anyone on the team. <laughs> That's the whole point. And because of the fact that what's happening in him not wanting to do that makes it even more painful for us to watch him go through it because he's not telling them because he's kind of protecting Megan. But he probably also feels guilty about all the things. Like, there's so many layers in it. So to have Alana, I think I'm pronouncing her name right, on the alien world saying, like, I'm an alien. (laughs) Like, we have nothing else to do except wait right now. And you literally won't ever see me again. Mm. So it gives him the opportunity to have this conversation, which he probably desperately wants to have with someone. And it gives us tons of information. So I talk about my holy trinity of things that a scene needs to do, right? Give information, develop character, or move the plot forward. And if a scene can do two, if not all three of those things in one tight scene, you're nailing it. If it's just doing one of those three things, it's going to feel flat. And that scene where he's talking to her, we learn all kinds of stuff. Yeah. He's not aging externally. <laughs> He's only aging internally, what happened with him, stuff that happened in the, in the five years in between. It moves the plot forward with understanding what Megan is now potentially capable of doing. It does tons of stuff in this one scene, all while also making me invest in Kleenex as a company because <laughs> my head is just soaked from crying. Like You just want to give him a hug. And taking those tropes and turning them on their head, like you were saying, like, we're looking at him going, okay, he's still being angsty teen guy. Oh, no, he's not being angsty teen guy. This is a perfectly reasonable thing to be upset about. And he's actually being very mature about the whole situation of the fact that someone basically went in and rearranged his memories. The same thing in that Black Canary um, therapy session episode where we assume like canary is that oh he just doesn't want to talk about his feelings and at the end you're like oh my god that's horrifying the idea that he's how do i live my live with myself with the fact that i was happy when all of my friends were dead because then i knew what i was supposed to be Mm. and who i was supposed to be it's just like god guys come on when he wasn't sitting there with that sort of that choice above his head of, of what am i and what is my purpose and he's like okay no now i know 
Yeah, exactly. I am weapon. And to combine that with all the other sessions, Robin's session about his translation of not wanting to be Batman anymore and what is he going to be. and It's just, yeah. I think we got a little derailed on being fanboys about it. But. <laughs> so the other thing about the practicality is fighting that compulsion we were talking about to explain everything as it's presented. Oh, uh, I have a PhD in meteorology. Let me now tell you the entire history of my, why I'm a meteorologist and my dad's love of comets or whatever, <laughs> right? Like it's irrelevant, right? You need to be, to hold off from that and let people ask the question. As long as it makes sense within that scene that you're doing, then just go with it and keep moving, mm -hmm. right? But you need to be consistent with that character too. And it, if you know that character really well, then you can drop these things little bits and pieces here and there. If you know McGann enough to know that the scene where Canary says, you've turned white. Oh, and she freaks. Yes. And she freaks out. Or even McGann saying, like, when they say, welcome to the team to Artemis, McGann says, I've always wanted to have a sister. I have 13 on Mars. But Artemis's response is, I wouldn't know. Implying that she's trying to say, I don't have a sister. Mm. After a scene where she was just dealing with Cheshire. And then once we find out Cheshire's her sister, that scene has a whole different view. But you have to know the character well enough to get inside their head and say, how would someone logically and emotionally react to this? And it takes a lot of work. You can throw the first few drafts on a page. That's fine. But then when you go back, make sure you're doing those things with purpose, right? Yeah. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> I mean, my, my biggest takeaway with that kind of thing is is knowing the journey that the character is on don't necessarily know where they're going to end up but if you know the journey they're on right you can write to that journey and you can write truthfully to that character and then if you're posing these questions you can be firm in the knowledge that you're going to be answering them at some point in a good way so yeah. when you get something like i've always wanted a sister i wouldn't know at the moment you're like, oh, okay, yep. Then you get the realization Cheshire is her sister. Then you, you move beyond that to understand that she doesn't necessarily see Cheshire as a sister because in her mind, a sister is someone that is there for you and family is something that is there for you. And she never had that with her family. Uh, so they are not family. Whoa. They're just they're people that are related to her. And then to see that, even from that point, that changes when you see later on, she has not a friendly relationship with her sister, but there is feeling there uh, when her sister thinks she's dead and comes to avenge her and that they are moving from that and they are moving sort of, you see the dynamic of those two moving towards being family. You see Cheshire and their father moving towards being a dysfunctional family, but family, but then she and her father don't. And she's okay with that. And seeing that acceptance of, you will never be my father, you're just the man that birthed me, but you could maybe be my sister at some point. And seeing that journey of her understanding of herself and her family and the way she reacts with them, if you're doing something like that, having that in the back of your head, knowing that this is her journey is what is family to me. And where are those boundaries? And those boundaries shift and change throughout the two yeah. seasons that we've had, and it'll be interesting to see how they shift and change further down the line. But that is her journey. Her journey is about family. Yeah. It could be argued, I think, that every character in the show's journey is involving family in some way. <laughs> yeah. Right? So Superboy, clearly. Artemis, clearly. McGann, clearly. Mm -hmm. Robin, kind of. Right? I mean, all the stories are different. Ugh. Like, Wally? Wally's the most functional family you've got. He's got basically grandparents and Jay Garrick, right? And, and he's got parents and they love him and they know who he is and they don't question anything. And they've got Barry and Iris. And he's got all this family, right? But then you look at Artemis, whose life is a nightmarish. Her childhood must have been horrifying. Yeah. To think that she is casually making the comment about the fact that her father may have wanted her to kill Kid Flash. And it's it's one not a joke. And now you've seen Sportsmaster being really bizarrely a competent character, by the way, from the comic. Freakishly terrible. And you have no doubt in your mind like, oh, yeah. No, she wasn't joking. He probably did want her to literally murder someone. And he's probably done that test in the past and she's probably passed it. 
uh possibly that's a whole that's a whole <laughs> <laughs> i mean being the father being the father of a you know a three-year-old girl right now and it makes me yeah sorry sportsmaster i i would not call him relatable why he was doing the things that he's doing yeah but i understand it and I think all of the villains are the same way. When we're talking about asking the right questions, in my head right now, I'm looking at all of the villains, and there are very few villains am I looking at saying, yeah. why are they doing this? And not feeling like I understood the answer. I don't agree with Lex's methods. I don't agree with Vandal Savage's methods. But I understand what he's saying. The human race needs to evolve and evolve evolution of this kind requires stress and strain and war. As much as I despise war personally, I can't argue with the fact that in World War II, we create, we said we're going to create 50,000 planes for the war and we made 100,000 planes for the war and it changed seeing what human nature can do. It's this horrifying duality of human nature that that happens. And though I don't agree with Vandal taking it to this extreme that he's taking it, it's not a completely ungraspable idea. Oh, God, yeah. Does that make sense? And with, with Sportsmaster, it's the same way. Like, hmm. I don't think he loves his children <laughs> the way that I love my daughter or that we see love differently, but he, his belief in the world is... To survive, you need to have these skills, and I am going to instill these in you no matter how horrible it sounds because mm. I want you to survive. And there is a piece of that that is very twisted and not okay, but can be seen as, I hate to say loving, but... Yeah, no, there is an element of he cares that they continue. And whether that's because he cares because they are his legacy or whether he cares because there is genuine emotional attachment... Yeah. And it's very interesting to see where that line may or may not be, but you can follow the logic and you're, and again, talking about asking the right questions, it's about the show positing situations where those questions arise. And never do you have a question of why is this character doing this? And then you don't get that satisfying answer. Yeah. And that is a large part of it is if you can ask, why is the bad guy being the bad guy? Oh, well, because he wants this and he thinks this is the way that he can get it. And you can understand that logic. It's not just, I'm being evil because, woo, evil. You know, yeah. even, even the aliens, like, why are the aliens doing all this weird stuff? Oh, because they would like to take over our world and utilize us and utilize our resources. And they're playing the long game. Yeah. And that's why they're doing things that seem a bit strange in the moment because they're in it for the long haul and they can be. Right. And, they, and even though they have technology that clearly outstrips ours... Why aren't they just taking over the planet? Oh, okay. Now we find out why because the guardians of the guardians of the galaxy, you know, who created the ridiculously powerful Green Lantern Corps, have stopped them and made them sign a contract deal that says you have to do X, Y, or Z. Mm. Someone has to agree to have you come. You have to be invited. Yeah, you have to be invited. And in this case, you know, okay, that makes it so that they have to do the long con because a more powerful force is protecting us. So much of this, I'm sure, is planned and plotted ahead of time. But I, I do wonder how much comes out spontaneously simply from the skill and experience of the writers and the showrunners without overanalyzing it. Like, yeah, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Sometimes, sometimes the blue curtain in the background doesn't mean that the main <laughs> character is full of depression and angst from there, blah, 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 blah. Sometimes yeah. it's just blue. You know, but that doesn't mean that it's not put in there in a way just simply because someone knows how to tell a story in a particular way. And does that make sense? It does. And certainly it's one of those fun things where kind of your job that's not your job because we love it is to sit down and overanalyze these things. I find it interesting in my own writing, going back and looking at things that I put in there that I wasn't even aware. I, you come to this realization of <laughs> this is this character's journey or this is this moment's journey. And you go back to retroactively make it so and realize you were already doing it and didn't realize it. Yeah. And speaking to other writers and it doesn't happen all the time, but you will have everyone that I know that, that writes has that story 
over the time they were working towards something and didn't even realize it. And so there will be times when you put in a blue curtain and you think it's just a blue curtain and it turns out, no, it is because of sadness. You just didn't realize it at the time, which makes this kind of over extrapolation incredibly strange and murky. But for me, media is for the consumer. What you get out of it is what you get out of it. So regardless of their intentions, yeah. if that blue curtain is sadness and that helps you feel sad and gives you connection to that moment, then that blue curtain is sadness. Yeah, I don't disagree with you at all. Um, mm. Gosh, we went all over the place, which I knew was going <laughs> to happen um, because I've heard you on other podcasts. Yes. And uh, I've also heard uh, the, the fabulous Neil, who um, also edits some of our episodes, talk about how your bromance started <laughs> and you just couldn't stop talking for hours and hours. And I knew that was going to be the case when we sat down to start chatting. But uh, I think we touched on all of the things that we wanted to touch on about basically making sure that you understand your characters to enough of an extent to be able to plant those seeds to not have to front load your reader, trust your reader to be able to ask the questions and be able to piece those things together. It's a thin line to walk, though, between trusting your reader and you know spoon feeding versus not giving enough data and information or not. If you have introduced a promise at the beginning of a story of this is a question we want you to ask and then not satisfying that question by the end of the episode, season, series, whatever it happens to be, that's a problem. But walking that thin line between the presentation of that data and information is why you have readers and editors and other people to help you make sure you're staying on track. And then, yeah, trusting, trusting in people to be able to put those things together, I think are kind of the key points. Any key points you want to make? I don't really have any key points other than I, I want Young Justice Season 3. <laughs> And which brings me to why did you when when did you hear about Young Justice season three? You heard about it before you even started watching it. I, yes, I, I heard about Young Justice season three before I started watching, but I'd been interested in season one and two as a finite product because when I first heard you talking about it, when I first got interested in it and put it on my to watch list, we had two seasons in the comics and that was it. I didn't even know about the game, and so getting that microcosm of excitement that the longtime fans must have and knowing now what they've set up throughout the series of what could be coming and knowing how good the writing and the story is. I mean, how I feel about it, jealous that I'm not a voice on it, basically, is, is probably how I... <laughs> if they call tomorrow and say, Morgan, can you come on and do a, a voice of a character? I will drop everything I am doing and fly up to America and, and go do a voice because, I mean, th that that really would be my dream come true. And it doesn't even have to be a man voice, just like two lines in the background so my name's in the credits and I can say I'm I'm attached to Young <laughs> Justice because it really is – when people talk about intelligent writing and intelligent story while still being fun and accessible uh, for all ages, this is the thing that I keep pointing at. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we can argue with you. And I'm glad it's always really cool t for me to hear new people coming in and watching it fresh and feel like they're getting the same, that same emotional ride, that it wasn't a dream, <laughs> you know, that it does matter and other people are seeing it too. So I can't thank you enough. Morgan, for coming on the sh and uh, chatting with me on the show, I think you and I are going to be chatting a lot oh, about I hope this so. as time goes on <laughs> and when season three comes out. Yeah. So um, if people want to track you down to um, argue and debate you on all the points you made today, where can they find you out here on Earth Prime? Ah, they can find me. Uh, sort of the easiest place to find me is on the Twitterverse. I'm either at Moron Jink, I think, or uh, you're more likely to actually find me on Going in Blinds Twitter which is going in blind DND, &D, and I tend to float around there. Or you can find me on, I don't know, if I'm on Facebook and Tumblr, but I'm hidden in secret. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, Twitter is probably the best place to track me down. Awesome. <laughs> and thanks to everyone, everyone for sharing time with us as well. You can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash crashingthemode, and on our website, www.crashingthemode.com. 
I can't recommend Morgan's guest appearance on Dungeon Master's Block highly enough. Going in detailed isn't just about running games. It's about sculpting images out of words and building tension through description in a way that every storyteller can benefit from. Then, go check out Morgan in action by listening to Going In Blind at goinginblindpodcast.com. And I'll just simply quote the website, expect a lot of fire and explosions. <laughs> <laughs> if you enjoy our show, please consider sharing with a friend. Of course, you can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on iTunes, Google Play, or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look a little harder to find those. I literally just found a couple from Canada that I didn't know were there. And even though Season 3 has been officially announced, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. Hashtag keep binging YJ on Netflix. Pick up the comics. Hashtag buy YJ comics on Comixology to get us more tie-ins and get yourself up to speed for the Season 3 premiere. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.